How much of a shock was this uh, global energy crisis for Pakistan in terms of both the cost, but the real indications that climate's at your doorstep, climate change is at your doorstep? Debilitating, both ways, completely devastating. One is debilitating and the other is devastating. So when you look at the impact of increase in energy prices because of the shift in geopolitics, uh, it's been debilitating. We are, we are 220 million people, mostly very poor, and the electricity bills and the energy bills have gone out of the roof. And it's become very close to impossible for people to afford energy. How would we manage this is a big question mark. Uh, we are struggling. We are trying to replace imported sources of energy with renewables, with solar. We have plans for 10,000 megawatts of energy, which we are going to, uh, solar energy, which we are going to introduce this particular year, within a year, so that we can replace the imported fuel with solar energy. That's one way of bringing the cost down as well as moving towards sustainability. So this is the debilitating part. It's not the devastating part. The devastating part is what has happened in the way of climate change and floods in Pakistan, and that has destroyed Pakistan's economy. Pakistan is mostly agricultural economy, and at just a month or two months ago, about more than a third of Pakistan was underwater. Uh, it's destroyed livelihoods, it's, it's killed people, it's, uh, it's taken wiped out cultural icons and cultural expressions in small villages which are there no more. Uh, and, and the most ironic part of that is that Pakistan has nearly a negligible carbon footprint. So it's not like we're producing a lot of carbon and we've burnt the environment and therefore we're getting punished for burning the environment. Well, the environment has been burnt. It's just that because we are at the foothill of the glaciers, the consequences of burning the environment uh, we have to face. And we find it's devastating because, we, because the cost of reconstruction is roughly $30 billion. Where would we get $30 billion? It's anyone's guess. Well, how do you manage the transition then? Because you have your priorities to make sure there's electricity for people to live. You have to use government budgets to buffer the impact of the energy crisis today and then still try to raise funds to make a, an energy transition, a green transition. They promised $100 billion to the developing world. In reality, can you get access to funds when you have a crisis to invest in the infrastructure of the near future? I mean, from so you can look at it from various perspectives. From, for, from the consumer perspective or the citizen's perspective, the government has to take care of them, so we are coming up with various kinds of subsidies. We are giving direct subsidies to the poorest of the poor. We are also uh, subsidizing the minimal use of energy, which is mostly done by the very poor people. By minimal use, I mean a few lights, a fan, and maybe one plug to charge the, to the, the cell phone or something like that. So we are subsidizing up to uh, 200 units, about 200 units, 200 units. So that's how we are trying to take care of the poorest of the poor. Uh, in terms of investments, uh, what we're trying to do is make Pakistan extremely investment friendly. And even with the, with the, the 10,000 megawatts of solar energy that I'm talking about, we're inviting all global players to come and bid on, 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 on this initiative. Uh, so we're very hopeful. We are finding uh, a, a lot, a lot of um, uh, interest uh, by various governments, by uh, private sector companies to come and bid in Pakistan for these 10,000 megawatts. So I think it would also uh, create a platform to attract investments, attract FDI, attract new technology, not just new technology, but also the tacit knowledge systems. Uh, we'd be plugged into the global value chains, we'd be connected with multinational corporations uh, who have new ways of running their businesses, so the business models in Pakistan would evolve, the technology in Pakistan would evolve, the FDI would come to Pakistan, and obviously when all this kind of quantum of investment comes into a country, they need local people, so people would get skilled, people would get trained. We have a lot of human capital, we have a lot of engineers, we have a lot of technicians, 
uh, they be groomed through these investments. So I think on the one hand, both for upstream investments in, in, in our exploration, we're trying to attract uh, global multinational corporations, also primarily in this sustainable energy initiative, we're trying to attract investments. And then we have for the connectivity, we need, we are offering investments in pipelines and so on and so forth, in terminals and pipelines. So hopefully, ooh, it's, it's a difficult time, but we'll come out of it. It's a resilient country. Well, We've it gone certainly through a is, lot. and a very big consumer market as well. Uh, do you find it a challenge, though, uh, faced with an energy crisis and being behind the curve when it comes to investment <coughs> in the energy transition? So it's a fight, is it? Not just for Pakistan, but for all the developing world. And we still talk about better than two and a half billion people that don't have access to energy on a daily basis. That's a crisis in itself, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I mean, if we had... if. If, if wars in the world had been planned better and the world had been informed a few years before the war that there was going to be a war, we could have planned our energy. Now, if the war comes about without planning, with the first bullet, all of our plans also go away. So that's exactly what has happened. With the first bullet fired, all of the plans that we had in terms of how we would provide, we are hoping for at least 5% growth sustainable, sustainable growth in Pakistan. Which is strong. Now, for 5% growth in Pakistan, we need about 7 to 8% increase in energy supplies every year. So we were thinking about the normal marketplace, the pre-war marketplace, the pre-geopolitical shift marketplace, and planning for the kind of energy which is essential to, to move forward. Uh, with the first bullet, all of those plans went out of the window. What was available for $6 is now not available for $40. A cargo which was available to us, the gas LNG cargo, which was avail available to us for $25 million, is now available for $128 million. Uh, when we try to get that cargo, our limits, country limits bust because we have a huge energy bill. We need, we, are, we import sometimes two and a half to $3 billion uh, worth of energy per month. When we go into the global markets, they say, oh, Pakistan, country risk, this kind of money, not available. Mm -hmm. So we are stuck, no matter how we look at it. But we're trying, we, we, we're resilient, as I mentioned earlier. We'll come through this. We are coming through this. We are rationing energy as well, which is sad part, which would dampen our growth, mm -hmm. which would also create hardship for the, for the people of Pakistan. Uh, but we have very limited control over how the, the, the geopolitical plates move under the earth and, and, and th throw developing economies off. Uh, final question for you, Minister. Uh, is there some hypocrisy when it comes to the international lending community? Uh, they were saying to Africa, like uh, <coughs> Senegal, Mozambique, Tanzania, we don't want to finance new hydrocarbon uh, projects like natural gas. Uh, we don't want people using coal. And then the crisis hits and then all bets are off. But they still don't want to apply that to a country like Pakistan. So how do you get around that hypocrisy and still develop a robust energy system, if you will? Well, I mean, hypocrisy is a strong word. And English is not my first language, so I don't know what the alternative is. So I'll go along with what you've said. Um, look, it appears that the coal in developing economies is bad, but the coal in developed economies is good. So this is bizarre. We were very reluctant. We have very large coal reserves, and we were very reluctant to very aggressively go after those resources because we wanted to be responsible. And we were pulling that back, and we were basically investing in renewables, and all of a sudden, one day we woke up, and we found that many of the European com countries are going coal, <clears throat> and they're also opening coal mines, and we were baffled. And I said, so, so which one is bad now? Uh, so we don't know. Uh, I mean, globally, we don't have a lot of a lot of financing available. You're absolutely right. There is, uh, if there's a softer word for hypocrisy, that word going on right now. Uh, I think uh, we were all partners in going green. We should also be partners in this hardship. And if we are not partners in hardship. 
uh, then at the end of the day, it would be detrimental for the climate, it would be detrimental for the world, because all of the countries would say, we're all on our own. So when you faced hardship, you went brown, we live in hardship, we'll go brown. That's not a good way of going. The good way of going is to put our arms together, understand that there are four billion people in this world who are treated like vagabonds. They live in the periphery somewhere. They're almost invisible. Let's make them visible. They are people. They bleed. They breathe. And they bleed. And therefore, we need to put our arms together. And when we want to go global in the way of climate and protecting our Earth, then we need to go global in a multifaceted manner. Terrific. Nicely done. Perfect interview. Didn't even have to interrupt. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.